Okay, um, could we settle down, please, if you're here for this session, so that we can start. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Osasu Bayuana, and um, I am chairing this session, which is titled Window Undressing Stories from International Sport. As we know, most federations have their windows shut, and sometimes with the blinds drawn. And most times it is often the work of journalists to open things, to undress things, and to put them in the open so that we can scrutinize them. We have a few stories from across the world which we're going to hear this afternoon. Um, I thought we were going to have five speakers on this, for this session, so we're, but we're having six, so we're going to have a, an interesting one hour. Um, I'm not going to take any questions from any of the speakers initially so that we can get through all the presentations and then I hope that we'll have roughly 40 minutes for a Q&A so that we can talk to them all. So we'll begin with a double-headed presentation which I think is the first one <laughs> for this conference. So I hope uh, the duo of Paulo de Gard and Andrea Celius will be able to get through their 10 minutes seamlessly. So I will ask them to begin with their presentation, which is titled, The Many Questionable Truths of the UEFA President. Okay, thank you. Um, after our presentation, I, we want you to elaborate on two things. First, why is Alexander Seferin the UEFA president? And second, what's the role of Russia in this presidency? Last year, the Norwegian football magazine, Josimar, where, the, where I had an engagement, was made aware uh, through a Dutch newspaper article uh, in the Folksrand that Kjetil CM. Uh, the outgoing Secretary General of the Norwegian Football uh, Association and the ingoing strategy advisor to Gianni Infantino was in a secret meeting in Milan and urged the Nordic football presidents to endorse Alexander Seferin as the new president. We follow up this story and we found out that also Alexander Seferin was in this secret meeting. Short after the Nordic presidents endorsed Seferin, even before he was a candidate, and even before he had uh, written down his manifesto, what to do as a UEFA president. Why? Short time after this, Russia, or Alexander Seferin went to Russia, and he was endorsed by Russia and uh, two handfuls of Eastern European countries as well. Our sources told us that the Russian interests, uh, the Russian interests, probably the Russian Football Federation, had lobbied for a Nordic endorsement before Russia said they would endorse him, because that would give the, Slovi the, 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 the unknown Slovenian much more credibility as a UEFA president than if the Russia was the first one to endorse him. Seferin was elected as president at, the, at an extraordinary UEFA Congress in Athens last fall. And as the UEFA president, Seferin was giving, given the position as chairman of the organizing committee of FIFA competitions, including the World Cup in Russia in 2018. After Yosimar revealed that North Korean migrant workers helped build Russian World Cup venues, a story that was referred to in all media all over the world. Uh, it was also discovered that these North Korean uh, migrant workers 
uh, help to finance the, the, the nuclear program of North Korea and so on. I asked Seferin at the UEFA Congress in Helsinki this April what he would do with this information as the chairman of this committee uh, supervising the, the World Cup in Russia. His response, he had never heard of these allegations before. We mentioned it on the press conference. And he was even not chairman of this committee. We called FIFA. They said that uh, he was still the chairman of this committee. And we also talked to other uh, football presidents that had been in two meetings with Alexander Seferin discussing the North Korean question uh, in Russia. So why lie about this? It's strange and it's very special. Well, we heard Andreas talk about that Alexander Chefrin have a questionable uh, route to become the UEFA president. But <coughs> our investigation also turned out, uh, it turned out that it was perhaps his route into football administration in the first place was very questionable. He was elected football president of the Slovenian FA in 2011. And in order to be eligible uh, as a candidate for this presidency, uh, he, the regulations of the Slovenian Federation stipulated that you needed at least three years of experience as a football administrator. Through a law faculty, private law faculty in, in, in Slovenia, who have been sponsored by the Chefrin Law Firm, uh, uh, where his brother is a lecturer, they sent like a ratified ex curriculum to the electoral board of the Slovenian FA to justify he had enough experience. And they listed three clubs. Well, the first one was a uh, Sunday league club. It's not in, under the umbrella of the uh, Slovenian Federation at all. And we have no, we could find no evidence that he had a board uh, uh, position there. The second one was a football club. He stated he had been a member, board member since 2005. Uh, there you can see it's still up on UFO.com, his CV. Well, the football club we call the uh, president, Samantha Lovse, and she confirmed that Jeffrey had been an active member, but just in a form like, uh, like when you're a registered uh, fan of a football club and never a board member. The last one, the last club he mentioned, was Olympia Ljubljana, where he was supposed to have been a board member since 2006. We contacted the club, and the press officer told us that, well, in 2006, he had uh, been involved with the club uh, for a short period as an external legal advisor. And he first became a board member in 2010. Uh, so in the end, he rose to football power with a fake CV. Well, after, before uh, Alexander Cheferin became uh, UEFA president, right ahead in July 2016, a team member of him from this Sunday League club, the Ljubljana lawyers, uh, Thomas Wesel, former state auditor of Slovenia, was appointed the, the new chairman of FIFA's Audit and Compliance Committee. This committee is an independent committee, and uh, Mr. Basel, he replaced Domenico Scala, who resigned in protest uh, when the FIFA Congress in Mexico earlier that year had uh, taken away, they could fire or hire uh, the chairman of these independent committees as they pleased up up until the next Congress in Bahrain, which was March this year. He, officially from FIFA, uh, Mr. Wessel was recommended for the position by the deputy chairman of the same committee, uh, Mr. Sin Mrs. Cindy Mabasa Koyana from South Africa. But Jeffrey admitted in an interview with BBC that 
it was him he had been requested to recommend somebody he had, he had recommended his teammate from his Sunday League club. Another investigation we did, it turned out that Thomas Wesel also weren't eligible for this position. Because in the FIFA governance regulations, Article 5.1, it says you cannot have a position as a board member at a local or regional federation in the previous four years. And it turns out Thomas Wesel was a board member of the Slovenian Federation's youth committee since 2011. He was even the deputy chairman since 2014. We asked uh, FIFA's legal division uh, a couple of questions. Uh, were, there, were there any exceptions to this rule? Do we interpret this uh, rule right, that uh, Wessel would be ineligible for this being a board member? And were there any exceptions? None whatsoever was the answer. When we published this, FIFA threatened uh, our magazine with a lawsuit uh, if we didn't retract this quote. Uh, we didn't, uh, and we haven't heard from the since. Well, this is quite disturbing, uh, and I would like to mention, uh, many of you are aware that one of the uh, chairpersons that was basically fired in the Congress at Bahrain this year, uh, among several others was uh, the chairman of the uh, governance committee, Miguel Maduro. Maduro uh, testified in the British Parliament uh, why he thought he had been removed after just eight months in the position. And he told, among other things, he was pressured uh, by the FIFA leadership, by Infantino, but also by the Secretary General Fatma Samura and Thomas Wesel, who went to Brussels to meet him, to persuade him to make Vitaly Mutsko eligible uh, to, to be elected onto the FIFA Council. So here is the Slovenian uh, independent chairman of a, a controlling organ of FIFA, uh, trying to influence another chairman to basically break FIFA's own rules. And what we should ask ourselves, uh, have UEFA and FIFA been hijacked by uh, Russian interests? And how can we not trust that uh, the governance of these uh, organizations really are, uh, are, are compliant to their own rules? Thank you. Unfortunately, I have to catch a flight, so I will just have to run, so Andreas will, will answer for, for us in the uh, question and answer section. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, it's now Declan's turn. Um, very interesting title, The Dead is Dead, The Russian Mob and the Sochi Games. Thank you, brother. Right. Um, is this on? Um, the uh, headlines in the Russian and European and North American um, newspapers were full of puns. The dead is dead. And they were talking about this gentleman, Aslan Usanya, uh, also known as Grandfather Kassan. He was probably, at that time, January 16th, 2013, the most famous uh, grandfather in Russia. He was also a um, uh, very well-known uh, mafia godfather. Um, this is just outside his favorite restaurant. It's an Azerbaijani restaurant in the center of uh, Moscow. Uh, he was shot with a single bullet from a rifle, a Val rifle. Now, the reason why I'm bringing a Val rifle up is that the only people that can get their hands on this are uh, the Spetsnaz, the special forces, the Russian special forces. Uh, so this was a highly unusual mafia killing for Russia. Not only was it highly unusual, it was highly symbolic. Um, I don't know how many people here have been to Moscow, but you can see 
the Kremlin, uh, just on the lower right, and on the extreme left is the U.S. Embassy. And it's pretty difficult, as we all know in this room, to find a more symbolic piece of land for the history of the last 100 years than that distance between the Kremlin and the American Embassy in Moscow. Arbat Street, uh, the Moscow Champs-Élysées is there. More importantly for anyone here who's interested in organized crime and sport, just at the corner of our new Arbat Avenue was the Inn Tourist Hotel. And for those of you ancient in lineage, you may remember that I spoke in 2002 about an organization called 21st Century, Century Association, which was basically a mob organization run by Georgian mobsters in the 1990s. Uh, the top two people were killed in mafia uh, attacks. Uh, I, with my Canadian television crew, went and interviewed the other, the next head of the 21st Century Association, uh, a man known uh, to the FBI and U.S. Congress as, quote, the head of the Russian mob, and his place was firebombed a couple of weeks after our interview. All that is in that area. Uh, the restaurant, should any of you guys be going to Moscow this summer, is a very good one. I recommend it. Great Azerbaijani food. I can see you're already interested. You, you sir, in the orange shirt. Your head is just poked up right away. Finally, a useful suggestion among all these things today. Um, and um, our man is in the middle. That's Aslan Yusan. He's the dead. And among the Vora Zikoni, he had a reputation as a kind of quiet diplomat. Uh, one Russian journalist described him as a man who always thought ahead of the game. In fact, at this uh, rather unprepossessing Azerbaijani restaurant, he would hold court. Uh, he was trusted among the Vora Zikon. Uh, Ivanchek, uh, the man that the Vora Zikon sent to New York to run the Russian mob, in America during the 1990s before he was stopped by the FBI, uh, would sit with Aslan Usyan and they would negotiate terms and treaties between the Russian mob. Um, there was a number of very controversial photos and videos of prominent uh, politicians. This one is a prominent politician that anyone from Armenia will pick out instantly. Uh, that is Aslan there. But probably the most uh, astonishing visitor at the restaurant was the gentleman on the right. Uh, for those of anyone who's news challenged, the gentleman on the left is uh, Vladimir Putin. You may have heard of him before. Um, he is purportedly the sun king of Russia, but the gentleman uh, to his uh, right, or our right to his left, is his, quote, uh, gray cardinal, uh, Vladislav uh, Sochov, and he, uh, is one of the most interesting men in Putin's uh, regime. If you have to sum up Putin's regime by studying one man, I recommend you take a look at Sobchov. He is a fascinating fellow who basically half Chechen, half Russian, plans Putin's response to the Ukraine crisis, response to the ongoing crisis in Chechnya, and met with the dead at his restaurant so that begs a question, doesn't it? If this godfather, gentleman in the gray suit and that slightly blurry shot, is so well-connected and he's so calm, he's so happy with the rest of the Vora Zikoni, what the hell is he doing being shot? Well, like many of the myths and legends of the underworld, specifically the Russian one, this one is actually not true. Uh, he is... Uh, rise to prominence and power was sustained by a bloody carpet of uh, uh, other mobsters killed. I won't waste your time or strain your uh, comprehension at this moment by listing an arm's length of Russian mobsters, Armenians, Georgians, Azerbaijanis killed, Chechens killed by him. I, I will say, however, what is without doubt is that the dead was the king of the southern Russia, from Rostov on the Don at the top of that map, down to Krasnodar, down to Sochi and Adler, into Ostia. This is essentially a photo of Sicily on steroids. It's very difficult to overstate the organized crime involvement in this area, and it's even difficult, more difficult to understand why you would put a Winter Olympics in this area. These are the men 
the dead and the dead, the people that he killed, the people who eventually killed him, that are behind many of the things that we're talking about. These are the real mobsters. These are the questions that leads to Boris Nemtsov, now of course murdered a few blocks away from the Kremlin on the other side. Uh, his colleague Leonid, who I spoke to a couple of weeks ago in New York, he is under hiding. This is, these men, Grandpa Hassan, is the reason why this Olympic, Sochi Olympics, led to a price tag of over $50 billion. Uh, Nemtsov and Martinyak uh, did the calculations on the Sochi Olympics, and they calculated that in one road alone, it would have been cheaper for them to pave it with gold than it would have been to pave it with tar uh, tarmac. These men are the men I want to remind you of in all the conversations. Before you get up and start talking about ethics and start talking about all these other issues that we love to do at Play the Game, these are the men who provide protection. This is a, a map of how you arrange a, match fi a fixed match. We talk often about players, clubs, fixers, betting agents, and bookmakers, but this is the real question of protection. And protection, sadly, in sports, in football, in the Olympic movement, comes from the barrel of a gun, and it comes from gentlemen like the dead. Thank you. Thank you, Declan, uh, and thanks for staying within the time limit. So, Alejandro Oliveira is a lawyer from Italy, and he will be speaking on Kuwait. Thank you very much. Tam is not my friend for uh, this presentation, but I will try to make it uh, as clearly as, as interesting as possible for you. I'm going to talk about uh, sports autonomy and good governance uh, with reference to um, the uh, suspensions, which the IOC, FIFA, and many other uh, international federations imposed on Kuwait. And as uh, the title may imply, uh, spe with special focus on the uh, suspension imposed by ISSF, International Shooting Sport Federation, uh, which was uh, lifted uh, following a CAS award. Uh, a factual uh, background is, uh, is needed uh, for your best comprehension uh, for, of these uh, presentations. Uh, the story, uh, the events are linked to the last two years so uh, we need to have a look at them uh, uh, quickly. Uh, it all started in October 2015, therefore more than two years ago, when uh, FIFA and the IOC, one after the other, uh, suspended the KFA, Kuwait Football Association, and the KOC, Kuwait Olympic uh, Committee, uh, allegedly for undue governmental interference. At the same time, the IOC, issued a circular uh, addressed to all the international uh, federations, inviting them to consider the situation in Kuwait with the respective national federations and adopt the, sorry, there is a problem with the slide. Okay. This is the right slide, uh, and adopt uh, the, the measures which protects best the Olympic movement in Kuwait. In reaction to that, the ISSF, uh, eight days after the IOC uh, suspension, uh, took the decision to suspend the KSF, Kuwait Shooting Federation. Suspension which was confirmed the following year uh, during the ISSF General Assembly. After that, in 2016, there were CAS proceedings uh, with uh, uh, taking into account the suspensions over KOC, KFA, and KFS. Now, what were the reasons? As I mentioned before, what were the reasons of these suspensions? As I mentioned before, 
Um, there was alleged uh, undue governmental interference uh, caused by amendments into Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti sports laws. Uh, amendments which gave the power to a Kuwaiti authority to disband the Kuwait Olympic Committee and uh, um, Kuwait Football Association's boards, not the organizations, the boards. And these were, um, the boards were replaced by interim committees which took care of the ordinary business, ordinary affairs of the uh, federations. These amendments were seen by the FIFA and the IOC uh, contrary to their statutory duty to preserve the autonomy of sports. Uh, here in the slide, I selected uh, uh, the fundamental principles of Olympism number five and the FIFA statutes article number 19, uh, which clearly provides that uh, the members of the Olympic movement and members of the FIFA shall manage their affairs independently and without undue influence from uh, third parties. However, on an additional note, I would like to point out that uh, the IPC, the Inter uh, International Paralympic Committee, did not suspend the Kuwait uh, Paralympic Committee. Um, so in 2016, as I mentioned, there were the, uh, the CAS proceedings. Uh, the first two, uh, addressed uh, the uh, KFA and KOC suspensions, but the uh, cases were dismissed. So the KFA remained and still is suspended by FIFA, and the KOC remained and still is suspended by the IOC. As a result, during the Olympic Games of Rio, Kuwaiti athletes competed independently, and uh, as you can see from the picture, um, they got uh, one bronze and one gold medal in shooting, and uh, the men Olympic champion in double trap competed under the IOC flag. However, the CAS proceeding uh, 4727, which I filed as I represented the K KFA, uh, upheld the appeal, and the KSF suspension was uh, lifted. So it's important to understand why this case had a different outcome. This is because we had at stake, I had at stake not just uh, issues related to sports autonomy, but also to good governance. Now, the ISSF uh, listed some uh, arguments uh, which allegedly justified the suspension of uh, the KSF namely certain provisions of the ISSF constitutions, Rule 26 of the Olympic Charter, and also because uh, the, um, the KOC, the Olympic Committee, were suspended two times uh, during the last five years. The bottom line for the ISSF was that uh, it was obliged to suspend the KSF in order to protect best the Olympic movement in uh, Kuwait. However, the CAS panel found otherwise because uh, the CAS panel noted that the KSF was suspended without being heard by the SSF Administrative Council body. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the factual background, it took only eight days for uh, the SSF to evaluate the situation and to suspend the KSF. The CAS panel also noted that no review was made by the ISSF, whether or not the KSF was concretely affected by undue governmental interference. So if the Kuwaiti sports law was somehow affecting the management of the KSF. Further, no investigation by the ISSF uh, was done whether there was some actual conduct by the KSF that was affecting the purposes of the ISSF according to the ISSF constitution. Then, uh, the ISSF claimed that it was obliged to suspend the KSF uh, just because the KOC was suspended twice in five years. But the IOC did not order the international federations to suspend uh, the respective national uh, federations. And in recent years, uh, namely Afghanistan, Iraq, and the uh, same Kuwait, were suspended by the, uh, by the IOC, but the 
ISSF did not, did not suspend the relevant national federation, which raised issues of equal treatment. Last but not least, the ISSF body provided misleading information to its members before and during the General Assembly, which confirmed the suspension over the uh, KSF. I have selected uh, for you uh, two paragraphs of the CASA word. Um, as you have heard from this morning's session, not all CASA words are uh, uh, published, uh, but you find the CASA word available at uh, playthegame.org. And I invite you to look at, uh, to look at the marked part of this uh, of these two paragraphs, which summarize uh, the reasons why the uh, suspensions against Kuwait was, uh, was ordered to be lifted. My conclusions are that while sports organizations within the Olympic movement, so members of the Olympic movement, shall have the rights and obligations to preserve the autonomy of sports, at the same time, they shall, uh, uh, they shall ensure that principles of good governance must be applied. And theoretically, the IOC abides to that because in 2009, uh, they issued a recommendation followed by another recommendation in, with the Olympic, included in the Olympic Agenda, agenda 2020. The, the IOC abides to that because it says that all organizations belonging, belonging to the Olympic movement shall adopt the basic universal principles of a good governance. So even the IOC theoretically followed this policy to ensure that best, uh, the best practice of uh, good governance should be uh, implemented. And my last conclusion is that there can't be sports autonomy without good governance. And the autonomy of sports organizations to self-govern shall find its absolute uh, limit in front of fundamental rights. And I mentioned earlier in this presentation about equal treatment and the right to be heard, as well as high standards of uh, good governance. Thank you very much. I made it. Yes, you did. <laughs> Thank you, Alessandro. So, um, Grit Hartman will be talking about the burden of a weightlifting president. Grit, how heavy is that burden? Uh, it's heavy for the Federation, I would say. More than, more than uh, a lot of question, uh, questionable world records in weightlifting. Okay, this is the guy I'm speaking about, Tamash Ayan. Uh, the president of the International Weightlifting Federation, and actually, uh, I'm speaking about him again. I did so at Play the Game four years ago. Uh, that time, it was about around about five million dollars uh, that mysteriously had vanished from the Swiss bank accounts of the IWF uh, accounts only Tamash Ayan had access to. So to solve the issue, after I reported on it, Ayan wrote a letter to some members of, it, of his executive board saying, and I quote, it was on purpose that we did not react to these articles as agreed by lawyers and experts in sports. So it was not really an exhausting explanation where those uh, five million dollars uh, had vanished to, but that was it. So this was a classic. Uh, sports leaders don't like to be held accountable, of course. And the same thing is true for doping, which is the topic now. You see, uh, he is, this is a quite uh, a quote from a few weeks ago, uh, what happened uh, regarding uh, doping cases in weightlifting. It's not by fault of the IWF. A few years ago, when uh, doping in weightlifting wasn't such a big uh, topic, 
he was smarter, uh, corruption exists in the handling of doping cases. So, um, uh, Ayan uh, was right, the so-called fight against doping uh, uh, can be a form of corruption and it's like this with uh, the weightlifting president. I will show you how. So on paper, uh, according to the figures, the IWF is an excellent federation. Uh, they are code compliant uh, with the WADA code uh, because they have more doping tests than uh, the rest of the federations in uh, relation to the athletes, of course more than 2,000 a year, and a lot of cheaters are caught. But uh, the motivation behind it, uh, is it really to reduce doping? At least it didn't work during the last years. Uh, something else did work out with the more than 200 sanctions uh, uh, by the IWF. They made a lot of money out of it. And one federation president put it like this, uh, doping is a money-making machine for the IWF. Uh, for instance, between 2009 and 2012, they cashed in more than three million dollars, more than was spent on tests, analytics, or education programs altogether. So, but this year, a lot of cases there, there came a warning from the zero tolerance boss of the IOC uh, saying uh, that weightlifting could lose uh, the place at the 2024 games unless their massive doping problem was addressed. Uh, uh, Bach, uh, Bach's uh, uh, Ross had a reason, of course, you see it here. 49 uh, doping cases for weightlifting uh, during uh, the retesting for the Beijing and the London Games. So, actually, uh, at the moment, nine countries uh, with three or more IOC retesting positives are banned for a period from, uh, of one year until next October. And in fact, it was actually the IWF uh, with, Tom, with Tamash Ayan uh, that banned the first country from the Rio Games. It was Bulgaria because of a lot of doping cases. So this is sounding like a good and straight anti-doping approach because uh, IWF, IWF really sanctioned countries uh, not really, because uh, those uh, cases uh, uh, couldn't come as a big surprise, at least not for Tamash Ayan. Uh, the same countries uh, that had a lot of uh, the culprits in the Olympic retesting had been identified as high-risk countries before, long before. Uh, those Olympic Games, but the intensity of the uh, out-of-competition testing followed other criteria. See, for instance, uh, uh, IWF and IAN tested in countries like Italy and Germany, where uh, his opposition came from, but not in the high-risk countries. So, and as one president put it, um, who is allowed to win medals in weightlifting, that's the decision of the president. So, doping, anti-doping as a question, uh, or in, yeah, a question of politics, a means for, for politics. Uh, just two uh, examples before the 2008 games in uh, Beijing, uh, um, with uh, a lot of disqualified uh, Chinese weightlifters, uh, not a lot of disqualified Chinese weightlifters afterwards, Ayan changed the system. Uh, athletes uh, had not to show up, for instance, during the World Championships in the year before to qualify for the Games. Uh, they could, uh, the Chinese, for instance, they sent a complete different team to the uh, World Championships in 2007, a complete different male team. 
and uh, uh, because the qualifying uh, system was by quota for a country, not by athlete. And so uh, uh, it was said the Chinese men, they underwent a doping program in the year before the games. They hadn't to qualify personally. And one official told me Ayan sold the medals to the Chinese. Of course, you can't take it literally because uh, there's no proof for that. But those three women, uh, they got their medals. Uh, they had to give in their medals uh, from the Beijing Games, not because of steroids, but because of uh, uh, HGH releasing factors. So, uh, same thing with the Russians, short example. Uh, before uh, the, oh, somehow, I don't know, problem? Ah, there. The Russians, uh, they didn't have any out of competition, high risk country in weightlifting, no out of competition testing in the pre Olympic year 2011, one out of competition test in 2012. And you see the result uh, with the Olympic retesting. So, um, of course, the Russians uh, were big supporters for Ayan when he was re-elected as a president in 2013 for his fourth uh, term. There's some history here with Ayan. He was socialized in uh, the communist Hungary and then already a secretary general of the weightlifting federation. And this is a report from a secret informant of uh, East German uh, uh, Stasi. And uh, he's reporting that Ayan uh, didn't report as a general secretary general of the IWF, uh, didn't report to uh, positive cases for the Soviets, uh, so that the Soviets um, didn't nominate a candidate for the IWF secretary general. So, and uh, so there's some tradition here, uh, business among. Uh, comrades. So, uh, in weightlifting, a lot of officials have become cynic because of this. You see, uh, this is the president of the Turkish uh, Federation. He was nominated for an award by Ayan, uh, despite having 23 positive cases in that year, 2013. And this was a mail sent by a weightlifting federation president. So, okay. Um, uh, sometimes uh, uh, this was uh, an accident that happened with the World Championships in Houston in Canada. Uh, it never happened before. Uh, 24 positive doping cases in 2015 for a reason. Uh, Ayan had to employ a new lab instead of Cologne, Houston. There have been logistic problems. He wanted to, to, uh, uh, to send the doping samples to Cologne, but it wasn't possible, and other uh, uh, doping control officers. Usually they come all from Hungary. So, and uh, these are uh, two points that should, uh, two practices not forbidden by any compliance rules, uh, but they should raise suspicions if an uh, international federation is using one lab only and doping control officers from, from one country. So, at work is a, a, a clean sport commission because of the threat to be thrown out from the Olympic program. Uh, and uh, just last weekend, they made a lot of uh, great recommendations. Uh, you can read them uh, here. And uh, they were all accepted by IAN. 
and probably he will sell it at his, as his legacy. But uh, you see the word of no confidence down here. Uh, last. Same here, word of no confidence. Uh, the changes in the uh, anti-doping uh, 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 policy of the IWF may be the most, uh, maybe the most important change is that uh, uh, IWF is partnering with the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Sport to manage the testing program and test distribu distribution planning. And this all is addressing uh, the governance problems of the past. So great ideas uh, could be the best program ever, but uh, uh, it's not really an achievement of IAN because uh, let's have a look who is responsible in the IWF for anti-doping. Uh, IAN was praised by WADA for this. He is a member of the foundation board. Uh, in 2014, he made uh, Patrick Shamash, the former IOC medical director, uh, uh, his, the, the head of his uh, anti-doping commission. Um, Shamash worked at the same time for the Russian anti-doping agency and they held a seminar, a seminar together with, Sham, uh, with uh, Natalia Zelanova and Yuri Nagornik, the bo boss from the Russian sports uh, ministry, uh, heavily uh, uh, involved in the, in the McLaren report and hev heavily implicated as organizers of the Russian state one doping system. And after the McLaren report was published, so, um, to close it, uh, the IWF uh, rules allow to sanction member federations that have, I quote, brought the sport of weightlifting into disrepute. Uh, of course, there is no such rule for presidents. Elections can be bought with favors, also in the so-called anti-doping policy. And so the question remains, uh, who should be sanctioned, the sport of weightlifting or the president of the IWF. It's a little bit rhetorical, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Grit. Um, we have two speakers to go, and um, I would appeal... Um, to you both, if you can really, really stick to the time, because we're overrunning a bit, and um, if we're going to have enough time for Q and A's, it will be good if we can keep it tight. So, yep, Lau Sen Brock will be talking about whether members of the International Handball Federation actually play handball. So, what do they play? Football, of tennis, football. <laughs> So this is made for dwarfs. Good. Yeah, you're very short. So let's uh, let's talk a bit about uh, a bit about handball. Even though I, I I might look like a good handball player, I it's not my my preferred sport. That would mostly be football, but still I. I think I would probably be one of the best players in several of the member federations of the IHF. Uh, let's start at the Congress here in November at the International Handball Federation. Two things happened. Mr. Mustafa, the president since 2000, was elected and he was running on a post once again. He often does that. And we're talking about a guy who's pretty scandalized. He has received uh, 500,000 euros from a company he had given the rights to sell the media rights for the world uh, championships. He has turned off the microphone for, uh, from opponents in presidential ele elections. He has done a lot, a lot of, th of things. But he was uh, elected once again, no big surprise, uh, really. Uh, and I think we should uh, take a look at this picture as well, because this is 
mostly about the small federations of international handball. Handball is a fairly small sport, um, but in some countries it is pretty big. This presentation will be about how he gets a lot of his, uh, his, his power from the small federations, but as you can see from uh, this picture, he is also saluted in some of the big handball countries like Denmark. This picture shows uh, it's from the World Championships for Women in 2015, where he was awarded this pretty hideous uh, collage of pictures with him and the Danish Prime Minister. Uh, because we don't want to, in Denmark, we don't want to oppose Hassan Mustafa since we often want the championships in, in handball. And if we oppose him, there's a risk that we might not get it. That, that was my take on it, not the handball federation's take on it. So, is it a coincidence? Oh, what we did, what also happened at the latest Congress was that another three members was admitted, so there are now 207 members of the International Handball Federation, which might be a surprise to a lot of people since <laughs> do they play handball in 207 countries? Hmm. Jamaica, Fiji, and Timor-Leste was admitted. Is this a coincidence? Probably not. In the time uh, Hassan Mustafa has been president, they have admitted 63 new members to the International Handball Federation. Um, and this is quite clever because the the way it is uh, made in, in most international uh, sports federations is um, the one member, one vote system. So, I mean, Tuvalu has the same to say as Germany, formally, uh, in an international sports federation. So, whenever he makes or helps to start up a new uh, federation in a new country, and he promises them some handball balls, some goals, and a few money, then he also, in most of the cases, get their support. Especially when he invites them to the congresses, let them stay at big hotels, pay for their journeys, and stuff like that. So, the question is whether he just creates his own power base, so to speak, or whether they actually do play handball and just really want to be a member of the International Handball Federation in these different countries. So before the World Championship in 2015, uh, we at my newspaper, Politiken, uh, tried to take a look at this. So we went through all the, <clears throat> the information on all the um, members of the IHF from the official web pages, was where we, was where we started. And we found out 120 of the Federation were not even a part of the world ranking. I don't think we see that in football. I think all countries are at least a member of the world ranking. 113 of the federations were really hard to find information about because they didn't have a, a web page, so they didn't have a functioning Facebook profile. Some did have web, web pages, they didn't work, they were filled with dummy text. Or, and as I wrote here, one even uh, showed Asian porn. It, it wasn't handball, I would say. And uh, quite a few of uh, the federations, we were not able to confirm whether they actually had a, a national league, some kind of tournament in the country. And uh, quite a few of the federations either did not disclose an address or only uh, disclosed a postbox address. So you could, uh, so it was, quite difficult to say whether they even have a headquarter, these uh, federations. So that led to what we called uh, the conclusion that they were more or less paper federations. They exist on paper, they do have some people who come to the congresses, vote for Mustafa, vote in whatever they, they, they have to vote about, and go back. But. We also tried to reach out to these small countries. Um, we would have liked to go to <laughs> all the small countries, but since in these modern media days, we don't have a lot of money and a lot of time, so we tried to reach out to the ones we could using emails, phones, whatever. And we did talk to some of them. 
And we do have some statements here. Uh, especially I like the first one from Viliamo Sekifu from uh, Tuvalu, who said, the IHF approached us to become a member, and they donated some balls, handballs. But we can't start playing handball until we have a coach. We don't know how it's played. It is a new sport here, so we need a person who knows it and can introduce us to it before we can continue. So to answer the initial question, no, they don't play handball at Tuvalu. At least they did not do two years ago. Then we had uh, Papua New Guinea, where he said, no, handball wasn't a sport here before the IHF contacted us and proposed to make it a sport here. They prefer football, to answer your question, Osasu. <laughs> uh, and rugby, maybe, I think. Um, so, as he said, you can argue that they put the cart before the horse. And then we also, uh, and uh, all these pictures, uh, by the way, are from Swaziland, uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Mavusu, who sent them. He was uh, really happy that the IHF had introduced handball. Um, we owe Mr. Mustafa big thanks. If IHF had not suggested it, there probably would not have been handball in Swaziland. My first task as the president of the new federation was to find people to play handball. And he uh, recruited them uh, in football teams, he told us. So obviously you can discuss, is it a good thing? Is it not a good thing? Uh, should, it, should, it be, uh, should a sport be in a, a country naturally? Or should you like, try to push it to get new members, as we saw at uh, IHF? My final slide, we started with the new Congress in November, and after that, one of my colleagues did a, an, an interview with the president of the Danish Handball Federation. And let me just read it a bit, because I think it says a whole lot of the culture in uh, the Federation. He were asked, why did Mustafa run on a post? Are people afraid to challenge him? challenge him? Are they just sure they will lose? I don't really know, but but the latter is probably the most likely. And he was asked, Fiji, Jamaica, Timor-Leste were admitted as members of IHF, but do they even play handball in Fiji? Have you ever heard of it? No, I have not. But I spoke to one from Jamaica, and he told me that they have around 50 players, mostly students, who play once in a while. And now Jamaica has the same vote as, for instance, Denmark, with around 100,000 players, and Germany, which is a big handballing country. And uh, the last uh, quote is actually my favorite, because he was, he was asked, and I don't know whether that says uh, most about the president of the Danish Handball Federation or the culture in IHF, but he was asked, the admission of Fiji and Timor-Leste just looks like a hunt for members so IHF can grow. Have you ever heard of handball in Timor-Leste? No, and honestly, I must admit that I can't say right now where Timor-Leste is located. Never heard of the country, actually. Thank you. Thank you, Yep. Um, very interesting presentation. So my, my question to you, my question to you, Yep, wasn't actually as uh, far-fetched as I thought it was. It was <laughs> And our final presentation is from my friend and uh, an Argentine football journalist, Ezequiel Fernando Mors, and the title of his presentation is FIFA Gate in Brooklyn. I'm sure it's going to make some interesting listening. <laughs> Thank you, Osasu. Hi, sirs. Uh, I am from Argentina, and my country was at the center of the scandal of the FIFA gate. Because, because of this person, um, this person is Alejandro Bursaco, the whistleblower. Uh, he was having a drink, just having a drink, at Barolac in Zurich when the FIFA gate scandal broke in 2015 pleaded guilty and turned witness in exchange for a lighter sentence, Bursaco was chief executive of Torneos, a TV company. 
he confessed last week at court in Brooklyn that he paid $160 million in bribes to more than 30 FIFA executives. He also accused the three powerful TV networks, Televisa, Fox, and Globo. Bursaco, in fact, was Julio Grondona's right hand man, the Argentine vice president of FIFA, now deceased. Bursaco became a millionaire with Grondona and the TV, TV businesses. I talked about Grondona in previous editions of Play the Game. Now Bursaco is giving details about the money, spitting accusations that Grondona was a much more corrupt person than we already knew him to be. Everyone in this country must remember the 1978 Soccer World Cup. Sorry, but Argentina beat Netherlands in the final match. Amnesty International asked Dutch players to boycott it because my country was suffering the worst of its dictatorships kidnappings, tortures, deaths, and amnesty had no success. My sources always told me that the military paid lots of money so that FIFA would not snatch the cap from our hands. At that very moment, FIFA realized that the World Cup was a toy worth its weight in gold. How much is Qatar 2022 worth today? Isn't it true that the French news had told us former President Nicolas Sarkozy ordered Michel Platini to make sure France voted for Qatar? Isn't it true that Blatter reported that also Germany was under political pressure to favor Qatar? Bursaco accused Commebol to cast its votes for Qatar but not just because of political pressure, because of personal corruption. Yes, Conmebol may be a bunch of, crack, of crooks, but beyond what the United States law could say, it is quite grotesque to say that Conmebol is a criminal organization. Sirs, we are not talking about the Medellin cartel or the Sicilian Mafia. There was big corruption in Conmebol, but there is no need for a show. Conmebol did not kill presidential candidates or judges. It did not throw bombs. We cannot even assert, as Brooklyn prosecutors did, that one of the three executives recently accused, the Peruvian Manuel Burga, made a mafia gesture to Bursaco, that if he talked, he would slash his throat. The prosecutors requested the judge to send Burga directly to jail. These prosecutors announced that there will be another lawsuit and they will ask for 20 more years in jail for Burga for obstruction of justice. The news came out everywhere. There was a lot of noise, but no formal accusation against Burga. The truth is that no one could see that gesture. It is not even visible in the two videos recorded and seen by the judge. What will be the jury's verdict? It is a secret jury. The prosecutors requested secrecy for security reasons because they say there were death threats. We don't know when this happened, who, where. The mafia criminals who repented themselves were called pentiti in Italy. The international press called Bursaco a whistleblower. But no, Bursaco is not a hero who wants to save the sports. He corrupted the sports. He was detained and he's speaking out of hope to reduce his penalty. We cannot compare him with Russian athletes who denounced a system. He's also far from being 
Colin Kaepernick. Kaepernick and hundreds of other US athletes denounced that in the United States, there is no justice for blacks. Black lives matter, they shout. Kaepernick was kicked out of the National Football League, fired as commanded by President Trump. Kaepernick is my Muhammad Ali. He could have never played that World Cup in 78. If I were to choose an Argentine whistleblower, I would pick Mario Goichmann. He was the maker of the 2002 Volleyball World Cup. The country, my country, was in shambles. And he invested his personal fortune believing that the International Federation would refund the money. But he crashed against the corruption of the Mexican Acosta, president of the International Federation. He lost everything. He documented the $33 million corruption of Acosta. In 2005, his courage was rewarded by play the game. Jens Seyer Anderson sent an open letter to the IOC and to the Argentine sporting authorities. He said that sport owes Goichmann a dignified life. Next year, Buenos Aires will host the Youth Olympic Games. In just four years, the Games increased their budget by 766%. It's a record increase in Olympic history. They will cost $450 million. Goichmann is claiming back just $1 million, but nobody takes his calls. Wasn't it, it, wasn't it the case that the IOC had initiated an austerity policy? The new resembles the old. In FIFA, they said that Blatter was the demagogue, but Infantino arrives and his first big decision is to increase the number of teams in the World Cup to 48. Here in another room, the great Brazilian journalist Lucio Castro is telling us who is Ari Graça, the new president of the Volleyball International Federation. How different, or not, is the Brazilian Graça from the Mexican Acosta. Just a few days ago, Goichmann tried to commit suicide. He was influenced by an Argentine lawyer who threw himself under the train after Busaco shouted his accusations in Brooklyn. Busaco was selective. So far, he didn't hasn't given names of CEOs from the TV companies that paid bribes. He just gave names of Conmebol executives and the names of two members of the former Argentine government program that held the broadcast rights to domestic football in the country. The program was called Football for All. Football is no longer being broadcast by the Argentine public network. With a new government, if you want to watch football, you have now to pay Fox or Turner, Turner, both American TV networks, both with partners directly or indirectly involved in the old bribes. Also, in the new Comable, matches are still televised by Fox. Also, the new Brazilian Confederation negotiated a new contract with Global. It will end in 2022. Goichmann is not a Russian. He could not be a political toy for anybody. Congrats to play the game, the only one that protects him. The other day I told him, Mario, please don't kill yourself. You are not like these people, you are not corrupt. You're just the opposite. I was trying to calm him down, but I've spent years unable to say anything else to calm his depression, unable to explain why sport, old and new, 
doesn't protect the decent people. Thank you. Thank you, Ezekiel, for that presentation. Um, I hope we have our roving mics ready uh, to take questions, but just before we take questions from the audience, I want to ask Yep a question. Um, I normally, I'm a football journalist, I'm a football broadcaster, but I'm really fascinated by your presentation on handball. And my question to you uh, based on the presentation you've made. Do you believe in the principle of one nation, one vote for sporting federations, or do you think that votes should be weighted based on the sporting prestige of each nation and their relevance to the prosperity of their sport? That's a, a really good question because, I mean, the. The, the clean view, and I mean, the clean way of democracy would probably be one one member, one vote. But I think cases such as the one in IHF, and I think you could do the same uh, for many other international federations. Uh, I, I think this is uh, is, a, is a model you have seen in in international sports uh, in many places. Uh, I think that shows the challenges of that principle, uh, because you can basically build your own power base. And as long as that's uh, possible, uh, I think uh, it, it, it's not possible to have a fair one vote, uh, one member, one vote system, uh, because, to be honest, it, it's it is not fair that so many people, which probably in total have like 5,000 handball players, uh, all amateurs, uh, have the same to say as uh, as Denmark, Germany, France, Norway, uh, Sweden, uh, the the big handballing countries, uh, Brazil. Um, for, for women as well. So I, I do think it is a, a system that is, a, and a principle that is, is, is deeply challenged. Yes, but that would turn democracy on its head, wouldn't it? it that's, you can say that, you can say that, but, uh, and you can also say that the problem isn't the system, but the, the ones using the system are, are abusing the system. Um, but as long as they do that, you, you, I, I think you do have to, to, to uh, put in some measures to, to, um, to handle it, whether it should be a, a whole, totally new uh, system where you weight the, the votes, I don't know, but it, it isn't that far-fetched. You do, you do the same in the, the European Union. Uh, every country don't have the same to say, so it's not totally far-fetched. Okay, we just have over half an hour for questions, so who has some? Who has some? Okay, yes, gentleman over there. Thank you. Uh, Lavor Komagdish from Croatian Radio Television. Uh, when you were talking about Alexander Ceferin from uh, Slovenia, uh, there were some uh, opinion in Croatia, Slovenia, and all that region that he is uh, very good in uh, sports international law, and uh, he will try not to change the qualifying system for uh, Champions League, which is now uh, pretty easier for uh, champions from uh, smaller countries that will not be in the future for one or two years. Maybe some additional comment about that in compare with you were talking about it. And uh, about International Handball Fe Federation, uh, maybe you don't know situation uh, about, for example, radio rights and commentary positions for world championship. Now, uh, TV rights has a Bain or Al Jazeera. It doesn't matter that it's Al Jazeera. But uh, we have a situation that, for example, for radio rights, you have a commentary position without real rate card, with situation with 500%, not 50%, 500% uh, uh, more expensive in, in, in compare with the last world championship with the position take it or leave it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, every time we raise the question of the credibility of Alexander Seferin. Every, uh, every um, body who supports him say that he's a lawyer. <laughs> we should trust him. Uh, Gianni Infantino is also a lawyer, I guess. So I don't know. So uh, 
if he's a lawyer or not, that's not how we go. Uh, it's not the basis for judging him, I think. On this qualification system, I think that uh, if, you, if you use uh, UEFA and FIFA, they are doing the same thing as Jeppe uh, just uh, told you about, that they increase the number of nations to secure their own position. That goes for the election in the Congresses, but also they increase the number of countries in the competitions so they can please more people and then they get re-elected. So I think uh, uh, that can be one answer to what you asked. Uh, and um, I think it's too many lawyers <laughs> in international sports probably because they only know uh, all the time how to answer questions and or avoid answering questions because they are lawyers. They should be more political and have more opinions. Uh, if I can say I'm a sports journalist, but uh, I finished back of the floor, but I agree with you. <laughs> And, and just one comment about the, uh, the, the TV rights for, for handball. As far as I remember, was it bought in Germany? Or, or was it, I, I think that it was really close, or maybe was not even bought in Germany because it, it became so, uh, so expensive and it was pretty close in, in Denmark too. So whenever you hear the argument from IHF that, that when you increase the number of uh, member nations, it's to, to broad out the sport, to make it more popular, to, to reach uh, all the destinations in the world, it sounds a bit hollow when, uh, when, the, when the cost is that you have a president who sells the media rights so expensively, so countries uh, where it's really popular can't even buy them. Okay, if we have a question from the person sitting next to him on his left. Uh, hi, my name is Matthias Seli. I'm a Hungarian sport journalist from Nemzeti Sport, and I would like to ask Andreas that so Cheferin was supposedly voted by the sub covered support of Russia. Do you know, or do you have any ideas, the motivation of Russia behind, behind supporting Cheferin and why did they choose him? Uh, I don't have uh, sources telling me directly what was the reason behind this, but uh, I guess they think they, that they can um, not control him, probably, but uh, have strong opinions on what he is going to do in sports. Uh, also, we don't have evidence that Russia manipulated everything, but it was in their interest. So, probably they lobbied towards some of the Nordic presidents or some Nordic personnel to try to get him elected or at least first uh, get him to be the candidate and then elected. So I think uh, we suggested in our articles that he, that in this game of uh, uh, proposing him and electing him, that the Nordic countries were promised some, something in, on the back room. One of the things we said was that probably the Swedish uh, president of the federation would become the vice president of UEFA. And if you check the website of UEFA, he is now the vice president. So it can be coincidental, but uh, some sources told us that this was a kind of uh, game that was played in the back, uh, back room. Andreas, I, uh, when I, can I ask a question to you. I think that's very typical for the Russians to promote their candidates and it's, it's a long history of that. And if I'm, if I'm right, uh, it was that important because Ceferin, as the UEFA president, uh, heats uh, FIFA commission, uh, which oversees the World Cup preparation. So that was uh, very important for the Russians to have their candidate there. Right. Yes, lady over there. Yeah, um, <coughs> thank you for giving me the floor. I'm Rosalie Namba from the Ministry of Sports and Physical Education, Cameroon, and a KBS member in the UK. Um, I will want to appreciate all what the various panelists have been saying here today. 
and it's given us um, a way for to actually see the mafia or the poor governance in this uh, really high sporting confederations. But then, as important leaders and play the game, and all of us seated here, does it just suffice to expose all these weaknesses? What are the monetary systems? What are we trying to do to stop all this mafia? I take the case of uh, Jeff Brook, who actually break down the bad governance system with the Handball International Confederation. To me, this is time for us to start saying this should be done or propose something. Because one, like he asks, one country to one vote, yes, that is democracy. But again, I don't see the criteria. We should put, we should say, this is a, these are the criteria. To become a partner, you have to merit this, this, this. They don't just, a president will not just move there and cope somebody who has never had the discipline running in his country. So I would propose that by the time we live here, we should look at what we think we can do to stop all this bad governance instead of just criticizing. Thank you. Okay, let me um, just kind of reframe what she said. Do you think it would be important in handball for there to be an established set of criteria that every country should meet before they are eligible to become members of the International Handball Federation? That is a, a, a brilliant proposal, uh, and I think that's the way, if I don't know about how you do it in, in other national, uh, international, uh, na na national sports federations, but that's at least how we do it in, in Denmark. You can't become a member of the National Olympic Committee before you, before you meet certain criteria. Uh, so why not do that in international federations as well? Uh, I, I think the answer lies between the lines because it's uh, beneficial for some uh, people not to have these criteria. Um, and I think the problem is that we need some people to stand up to these power men. Uh, we, we need some people to, to, to shout and to, and to take the battle. And we have discussed this uh, many times with the Danish Handball Federation. We have at my new pa newspaper, we have at, at, at Jan's uh, newspaper, Extrablad down there, we have in many Danish media discussed it with the Danish Handball Federation, why they don't do something about it. And, and I think the fair answer is that they don't dare do it. They're afraid that they will be put out of influence if they try to take this battle. Uh, they, they, have, they think they will lose out on, on international tournaments, championships, stuff like that. So they don't have the, they don't have the balls, basically. I mean, in most international federations, it would be fair to say that the economic power for the survival of those sports are in one part of the world, probably in, in Europe and, and North America, and to some degree in Asia in some parts, whereas the number, the overall number who don't have the economic power from the developing countries. So in a way, doesn't that, shouldn't that sort of balance out things? Because it wouldn't be right if too much power is just concentrated in one part of the world without there being a counterbalance in the other. Uh, I definitely agree, but, but as IHF, you could, it, you, it, you could just help the new countries develop before you accept them. There, there's no need, uh, the, it, it shouldn't necessarily be a criteria that you have to be a member of the IHF to get money from IHF. I mean, then they can start building up uh, handball in some of those countries that need the help. And then when they have, uh, when it's, uh, it's safely grounded in the country and it uh, can, can hold itself, then they can become members of the IHF or other international federations. So they can help countries that are not members. And in the parts of the country where they need the help to develop the sport. Yes, Ezekiel, you want to say something? Yes, uh, in another point of view. Um, did you remember, in, in seven, 1974, Abelange won the FIFA elections. Um, and he said, 
Africa will have place in the World Cups. Because before, with Stanley Rouse, Africa had no place in the World Cups. And so the abuse was from the other part. Well, to be fair, not the, until 1970. The, yes, 70. Yeah, yeah. To 1970. Yes. Yeah. And, and so Abelange won the election with that uh, key. Uh, Abelange is the Che Guevara. No, he was a corrupt, okay? <laughs> he won more votes, too, for him. But his, um, reason, he, was re he had reason when he decided to Africa have a more place in the World Cup. Yeah, I also believe it. It is not black and white. Uh, and especially we, earlier, was it earlier today or yesterday, we discussed the uh, development, uh, development funds in the different international federations. Uh, to me, the problem isn't necessarily that, that FIFA promises more money to its members. Yes, it, it is a model of, uh, of getting votes, I believe. But the biggest problem is uh, whether these, uh, these uh, projects are being audited and overviewed or not. Do, do the money actually go to football fields or handball fields and, and stuff like that, relevant stuff for the sports, or do they actually go to, to powerful uh, men in those countries? So I, I do believe that you should, you should uh, help uh, other parts of the world. It's not like we, we don't want uh, African countries in, in, in handball. We, we need uh, African uh, countries, but, but uh, the way they use the system uh, is, is basically more abuse than use. Um, yes, the lady, lady over there, want to ask a question? Okay, gentleman over there. Uh, good afternoon, this is Simon Legion. Um, perhaps, I mean, I, 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 I don't think, I don't think uh, people even in this room would be overly happy with, if international federations, including the International Handball Federation, would start donating money to entities in African or you know Pacific Islands, uh, African countries or Pacific Islands that are not even members of IHF. So that would probably not a very not be a very good idea. Um, but I wonder if a potential solution would be to introduce some sort of moratorium in general assembly votes or general assembly voting. So for instance, Jamaica would be welcome to introduce. Uh, or to create a national handball federation, only they might be uh, perhaps not allowed to vote on all or some decisions for a certain period of time, for instance, for eight years, which you know, if a um, time limit on uh, elected functions would be introduced, might reduce the incentive to just create new federations um, for the purpose of securing, let's say, votes in presidential elections. I don't know if anyone has, has a comment, perhaps Andreas. Yes, Andreas. I just want to connect Oliveiro and Yeppe's uh, two speeches. because I, Last year, Jan and me, we, we studied the Kuwait case quite closely. And um, the IHF, the Handball Federation, was probably the first confederation to expel Kuwait because of what you explained. In political interference in, in handball. And if you take the stories from Jeppe, I, I don't know how much political interference it is in Tuvalu or St. Louis and these countries, but it's a kind of, it's hypocritical what is going on here when the International Handball Federation can expel Kuwait for political interference and at the same time include <laughs> nations that you don't even have... Uh, have a handball. I guess some politicians there also are involved in this because they can receive money from this from the International Handball Federation. So if you compare these two cases, uh, Kuwait is expelled from I think it's 15 federations because of political interference. They say, I think it's more uh, intriguing uh, or more intricate than th that. I think it's about uh, conflict in the royal family in Kuwait. It starts there. But it makes no sense that uh, to expel Kuwait in the one case and at the same time take in a lot of countries <laughs> with no political control at all. So. Uh, my name is Johan Skoczek from Austria. 
I have a question, threefold question for Mr. Declan Hill. Um, did I get it right that uh, Usoyan was shot by the Russians to uh, make it possible for them to uh, wield their own protection system for the batting machine? Secondly, how much money do you know, or can you suggest how much money they made out of this? Third, um, do you know of any uh, things like that in other countries uh, before other mega events? Uh, uh, first of all, thanks very much for the questions. Let's, let's just walk our way through this one. So uh, I'll start with the, the last one. The best case that uh, reminds me of the mob influence in the construction of the Sochi Olympics is Montreal, 1976. That was a fucking nightmare of mob control. And it was only, I think, in 2006 that the people of Canada finally finished paying for those Olympics. And it was Genovese, Lucchese, Bonanno crime families that made out literally like bandits in Montreal. So it was interesting doing the research in Russia over the last couple of years, because I'm like, guys, I know this story. This is, this is old stuff. Um, just to be absolutely clear, this doesn't have anything to do with sports gambling. I've done lots of other research on Russian sports gambling, but I'm not talking about that today. This is simply and specifically about the guys doing protection rackets behind the McLaren report, behind the Sochi Olympic stuff. These are the people that we're talking about in the shadows of what's going on in Russian sport. Not all sports, not, uh, not every single sport, but these are some of the people that exist there. Tell me one of your first questions again, brother. I, I've, I've forgotten it. Do you have any idea how much money the betting machine protected by the Russians made? Sorry, the betting. The betting. Uh, so, so you're going back to my sports gambling yeah. stuff. I, I'm sorry, I can't give you an accurate okay. thing. I, I know it's billions, but I, I've never seen the books. The Russian sports gambling people have never opened up their books, unlike some of the, uh, some, uh, some of the Asian guys. Um, but the, the um, Russians have never done that for me. Maybe she, they should do that <laughs> to open. To I, I've, I've had conversations with, with a number of them, um, and the numbers are interesting. And it's interesting that that the Russian illegal sports gambling, because it's now almost entirely illegal, um, is another world from the stuff that you and I have talked about before. Again, I've got a book and major stories coming out about this, so I'm kind of dancing around. I'm sorry, I can't be completely open. And what was, and what was your last question? Lo lost the uh, rivalry against the Russians. Sorry, brother? Uzoyan lost against the Russian mob. It, it, it's complicated. They only give me 10 minutes to tell a, a, a complicated story where the, um, uh, where the Russian special forces are backing various members and not all the FSB was in favor of killing him. The key point that I think if you're going to Russia in the spring to remember is the FSB is a vast, huge... Uh, military espionage machine and it backs and is in league and is sometimes fighting against various elements of the Russian mob. So it, it, it's, a, it's, it's really two, uh, two sections of mob. One is the Vora Zakoni, which is the traditional guys, the tattoos, Aslan Usyan and many other guys like that, Ivanchuk, Tawanchuk, all those guys. And then it's the FSB and the many different chapters in there. So Good. basically, we're talking about the McLaren report for grown-ups. Yeah, when I read the McLaren report, they kept inferring protection, or, they, or you'd see some of the witness testimony. People would talk about, oh, I'm really scared, or I'm this. I'm like, oh, who are you scared of? And so that's why I decided to start investigating it. I start, started figuring out who were the people they were really frightened of. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, very much. I just want to clarify last comments from Andreas. Um, Kuwait sports bodies are not expelled, they are suspended, which is uh, an important difference. Then to answer your question, is it a political case? Uh, I'm talking as a lawyer. The answer is yes, it is a political case. And, uh, but it turned out that this was an opportunity for the entire uh, world of uh, the entire country of Kuwait to make the proper 
reforms and uh, the new Kuwait sports law will uh, be enforced really soon, maybe before the end of this year. And then the latest at the beginning of next year. And then the suspensions in one way or the other uh, shall be lifted because the political case will be overcome by the legality. Uh, the new Kuwait sports law will be a state of art, if I may say that. Thank you. Okay, just before, I just want to ask Ezekiel a question. Um, the, trial in, in the trial in the US, it, it makes for fascinating drama. I mean, all the, the excerpts that we're getting from the courtroom. But I'm, I'm really curious and want to know that, do you think that the culture in South America is going to change at all as a result of this trial? Do you think that things would become more ethical? Or do you think that uh, many people are just waiting for the blowback to die down and it will be business as usual in a while? Sorry, but the only change at the moment uh, is the business. Now there are new contracts of TB. <laughs> uh, other hands, the business uh, uh, goes to other hands. Um, you know, uh, Bursaco is there because it's still there because now uh, Paraguay, after a long battle, is not finished because the Supreme Court need the, uh, have the last word. Uh, gave the extradition of uh, Nicolas Leos, the um, comable chief. And Bursaco could be a witness, a, a, a witness very important uh, for Leos too. Um, but in the, the comable is in another Paraguayan hands, uh, Alejandro Dominguez. Uh, he was closest uh, ally of uh, Naput, one of the three that it is now in the trial, Paraguayan, Paraguayan too. And in Argentina, we have uh, elections uh, after 35 years of the Grandona Kingdom, uh, 35 years, incredible, but it was like that. Um, we have elections, uh, but there, there was a, a kind of intervention, of the, a FIFA intervention, and it was not good for the Federation, really. It was a change of business. Our national team suffered a lot because they didn't pay salaries to the coaches. So, you, you know, Argentina is a very well-known team, and the, he quali qualified Argentina for the World Cup at last moment, the last, minute, last match. And the FIFA intervention in, in our national federation uh, influenced in that uh, bad moment for our football. It was not good. Um, uh, there, there, are nation, there, are, there were elections, and they decided uh, a surprise member. Uh, it's, very, uh, we, we, it's very hard to say now if the changes will we have we will be effective we we have a super league now the business is in other in, in another hands but um the people the people is the, the system is practically the same all these people admire grandona admire uh, the the argentine national team is training in a camp that it is called julio grandona <laughs> uh, uh, and they, they, it's very naturalized that there is no, no, no claims against that. So you're not very hopeful for the future, are you? So, I so say you're not very hopeful that things will change. Oh, uh, well, uh, let me some more years. Uh, uh, we, uh, you know, as, as I said uh, with Infantino, his first big decision was to increase 48 members, the World Cup. But Blatter was the demagogue. Uh, why? Why did you change? Uh, I think maybe the only, uh, the only uh, thing that the FIFA did well was the World Cup in terms of competition. We were all fascinated with the competition. But they increased the 48 to 48, the numbers. Uh, why? Why did you do it? 
Well, it's, it's a good question because personally I think that the increase in numbers dilutes the quality. But I think from the FIFA perspective, they think that it will earn them more revenue and more votes, at least for those who expand the competition. Yes, Declan, you wanted to say something. Um, Ezekiel fernandez Morris and I are, are old friends and colleagues. Um, as far as his um, analysis of the Brooklyn and Comma Ball and CONCACAF corruption, I disagree with every syllable he says. Um, uh, I've had the uh, privilege of going through the thousands of pages of... Oh, the microphone has gone off. Ezekiel clearly has contacts somewhere that I don't. <laughs> Brilliant. I don't know how the man does it. Look, there's a really easy way of um, changing the uh, culture of corruption in Latin America and, and the Caribbean. And, and, and that is clear in these court documents in Brooklyn. And I know it's going to sound like I'm, I'm sucking up favor with my friend Sarah and uh, Kristen and, and Laura Robinson and all the other ladies in the room. But the, the people that are driving the Brooklyn FIFA trial are women. The person who initiated the trial was Loretta Lynch. The person who's in charge of the uh, Eastern District of New York is a woman. Pamela Chen is the judge. The chief prosecutor is a woman. And you're seeing in the court testimonies and the thing as they're starting to interview people, they're like, what? Are you serious about this? These are complete outsiders walking into a very corrupt boys club and having no time for it. So a quick way of changing Commable is fire every man and bring in women. And, and it's not because women are inherently better or worse than men. It's just bring in and clean up the outsiders. Uh, and the American women are, are really doing a good job at Brooklyn. And it is a mob trial. And it is about violence. And it is about mafiosi. And I'll be talking about that in the next section. OK, I think that this is going to be the last question. Uh, I would like to ask Declan very briefly that do you know what was the involvement of Russian mob in Sochi was it simple extortion or let's say they were setting up their own construction businesses and pushing out competition or, or basically what, what's the outline? It, of it is really difficult to overstate how much the Russian mob was involved in the Olympics and uh, this is in Declan Hill, the Canadian investigative journalist that spent the last couple of years shuttling in and out of Russia. This is the words of even Putin's people. I mean, they were deeply, deeply involved with that. And that map of Rostov on the Don down through much of the, uh, that area, you, you know, when Putin's sending his essentially second in command to go and negotiate with this guy in a, in a restaurant, you know how serious they're taking it. So they're there, their fingerprints are all over those Olympics and going forward. Yes, Ezekiel. Just, just I need to say one thing. Uh, football is incredible because, you know, uh, USA is the great actor in FIFA's corruption now. Uh, and USA didn't qualify for the World Cup. And didn't qualify because of a goal, Ill 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 illegitimate goal. It was not called the TV show that the ball didn't cross the line. And USA is not in the World Cup with so strong power, with so prosecutors, the judge, FBI, all of that. But USA will not play the World Cup. So uh, it's a good um, point of view for the decency of the football. Well, they're not the only ones not playing. Holland are not there, neither are Italy. But. That's what makes the game of football so interesting. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope we've had a, a good session.